All right, we're going to read the last section of Stargirl, finishing up the book. Um, this is going to start with chapter 30, and in this version, that starts on page 161. Chapter 30. As we idled, stunned and silent, in front of Dory Dilson's sign, Susan's parents came and retrieved her from Mr. McShane's car. As in all things, they did not appear especially surprised or emotional over what was happening. Susan seemed in a trance. She sat beside me, staring vacantly at the sign through the windshield. Her hand was no longer holding mine. I groped for words but could not find them. When her parents came, she allowed herself to be led away. As she got out of the car, the silver plate slid from her lap and rang like a dying bell against the asphalt. Her father picked it up. I thought he would take it, but instead he leaned into that, to the back seat where I sat and with a strange smile gave it to me. I did not see her for the rest of the weekend. By Monday, she was Stargirl again. Floor-length skirt, ribbons in her hair, just like that. She went from table to table at lunchtime, passing out happy face cookies. She even gave one to Hillary Kimball. Hillary took off her shoe and used it like a hammer to smash the cookie on the table. Stargirl strolled among us, strumming her ukulele, asking for requests. Cinnamon perched on her shoulder. He was strapped onto a tiny toy ukulele. She made her voice squeaky and kept her lips from moving, and it was as if Cinnamon was serenading with her. Dory Dilson blessed her, stood and applauded. She was the only one. I was too stunned to join her, and too cowardly, and angry, and not wanting to show approval for her return to Stargirl. Most of the students did not even look, did not even seem to listen. At the bell as we left the lunchroom, I looked back. The tables were littered with cookies. Walking with her after school that day, I said, I guess you've given up, huh? She looked at me. Given up? On what? I'm being popular. I'm being... How could I say it? She smiled. Normal? I shrugged. Yes, she said firmly. Yes? I'm answering your question. The answer is yes. I'm giving up on trying to be popular and normal. Her face and body language did not seem to match her words. She looked cheery, perky. So did Cinnamon, perched on her shoulder. Don't you think maybe you should back off a little, I said? Don't come on so strong? She smiled at me. She reached out and brushed the tip of my nose with her fingertip. Because we live in a world of them, right? You told me that once. We stared at each other. She kissed me on the cheek and walked away. She turned and said, oh, I know you're not going to ask me to the Ocotillo ball. ball. It's okay. She gave me her uh, smiles of infinite kindness and understanding. The smile I had seen her aim at so many other needy souls, and in that moment, I hated her. That very night, as if we were planning a, uh, playing a scripted role, Kevin called me and said, So, who are you taking to the Ocotillo ball? I dodged. Who are you taking? Don't know, he said. I don't know either. There was a pause on the other end of the line. Not Stargirl? Not necessarily, I said. You trying to tell me something? What would I want to tell you? I thought you were a two. I thought there was no question. So why are you asking, I said, and I hung up. In bed that night, I became more and more uncomfortable as the moonlight crept up the sheet. I did something I had never done before. I pulled down the shade. In my dreams, the old man on the mall bench raised a wobbling head and croaked, How dare you forgive me? Next morning, there was a new item on the plywood roadrunner, a sheet of white paper. At the top of it, it said, Sign up here to join. New musical groups. The Yuki Dukes. No experience necessary. There were two, uh, two numbered columns for names, 40 in all. By the end of the day, all 40 were filled in with names such as Minnie Mouse, and Darth Vader, and The Swamp Thing. The principal's name was there, too, and Wayne Parr, and Dory Dilson. Did you see, said Kevin. Somebody wrote in Parr's name. We were in the studio's control room. It was May, and our hot seats were over for the year, but on some days we still gravitated to the studio after school. I saw, I said. He stepped up to the blank monitor, studied his reflection. So, I didn't see your name on the list. Nope. You don't want to be a Yuki Duke? Guess not. We fiddled with the equipment for a while. Kevin walked out onto the stage. He flipped a switch. 
His mouth moved, but I couldn't hear. I held the soft pad of a headphone against my ear. His voice seemed to come from another world. She's turning goofy again, isn't she? Worse than ever. I stared at him through the glass. I put the headphone down and I walked out. I understood what he was doing. He had decided that it was now okay to say bad things about Stargirl. Permission to do so must have come from my behavior. Apparently, the first to read me was Stargirl herself. I still felt the sting from her remark about the Ocotillo ball. Was I that obvious? Classrooms, hallways, courtyards, lunchrooms, everywhere I went, I heard her disparaged, mocked, and slurred. Her attempt to become popular, to be more like them, had been a total failure. If anything, they just detested her more now. And they were more vocal about it around me, or was I just listening better? She and Dory Dilson, the only Yuki Dukes, did a duet in the courtyard one day after school. Stargirl strummed the ukulele, and they both sang Blue Hawaii. Clearly, they had been practicing. They were very good. They were, only ve they were also very ignored. By the end of the song, they were the only two left in the courtyard. Next day, there they were again. This time, they were, they were wearing sombreros. They sang Mexican songs. Cielito lindo. Vaya con Dios, my darling. I stayed inside the school. I was afraid to walk on past them as if they weren't there. I was equally afraid to stand and listen. I peeked from a window. Um, Stargirl was doing her best imitation of a flamenco. The click of castanets came through the window pane. Students walked past, most of them not even glancing her way. I saw Wayne Parr and Hillary Kimball go past, Hillary laughing out loud, and Kevin, and the basketball guys. I realized now that the shunning would never end, and I knew what I should do. I should go out there and stand in front of them and applaud. I should show Stargirl and the world that I wasn't like the rest of them, that I appreciated her that I celebrated her and her insistence on being herself, but I stayed inside. I waited until the last of the students had left the courtyard and Star Stargirl and Dory were performing for no one. To my surprise, they went on and on. It was too painful to watch. I left school by another door. Chapter 31. As she had predicted, I did not ask her to the Ocotillo Ball. I did not ask anyone. I did not go. She did. The ball took place on a Saturday night in late May on the tennis courts of the Mika Country Club. When sunset went down, was down to a faintly glowing ember in the west, and the moon rose in the east, I went forth on my bicycle. I coasted by the club, festooned with Cantonese lanterns. The ball in the distance looked like a cruise ship at sea. I could not identify individuals, only stirrings of colors. Much of it was powder blue. The day after Wayne Parr said he had chosen powder blue for his dinner jacket, Three quarters of the boys ordered the same from Tuxedo Junction. Back and forth I cruised in the night beyond the lights. Music reached my ears as a random peeps. The desert flowers, so abundant in April, were dying now. I had the notion that they were calling to each other. I cruised for hours. The moon rose into the sky like a lost balloon. Somewhere in the dark shapes of the Maricopas, a coyote howled. In the days and weeks and years that followed, everyone agreed. They had never seen anything like it. She arrived in a bicycle sidecar, just big enough for her to sit in. The sidecar had a single outboard wheel. The inboard side was braced to the bike. Everything but the seat of the bike and the sidecar bench were covered in flowers. A ten-foot blanket of flowers trailed the rear fender like a bridal train. Palm fronds flared from the handlebars. It looked like a float in the rose parade. Dory Dilson pedaled the bicycle. Eyewitnesses later filled in what I could not see, Parents' cameras flashing, floodlights, making a second day as the gorgeous couples disembarked from limos and borrowed convertibles and promenade to the festive courts. Showers of applause. Suddenly, the flashing stops. The floodlights dim. A hush falls over the crowd. As a particularly long, white limo rolls away from the entrance, here comes this three-wheeled bouquet. The driver, Dory Dilson, wears a tailed white tuxedo and tall silk hat. But it is her passenger who rivets the crowd. Her strapless brown gown is a bright, rich yellow, as if pressed from buttercups. There must be one of those hooped contraptions underneath, for the skirt billows outward from her waist like an upside-down teacup. Her hair is incredible. Descriptions clash. Some say it's the color of honey. Some say strawberries. It's fluffs, uh, it fluffs like a meringue high upon her head. It's a wig. No, it's all hers. Both sides are certain. Earrings dangle. They are little silver somethings, but what? 
They are partly obscured by falling ringlets. Many answers are offered. The most popular is Monopoly pieces, but this will prove to be wrong. From a rawhide string around her neck dangles a white, inch-long, banana-shaped fossil, identifying her as a member in good standing of the loyal order of the stone bone. While others wear orchids, the corsage on her wrist is a small sunflower, or a huge black-eyed Susan, or some sort of daisy. No one is sure except that the colors are yellow and black. Before proceeding, she turns back to the bicycle and bends over a small basket hanging from the handlebars. The basket, too, is covered with flowers. She appears to kiss something in it. She then waves to Dory Dilson. Dory salutes, and the bicycle pulls away. People nearby catch a glimpse of tiny cinnamon-colored ears and two peppercorn eyes peering out of this basket. Beautiful, unusual, interesting, different, regal. These words will come later from the parents lining the walk. For now, there are only stairs as she makes her way from the entrance to the ball. Someone recalls a single camera flashing, but that is all. She is no one's child. She is the girl they have heard about. As she passes by, she makes no attempt to avoid their eyes. On the contrary, she looks directly at them, turning to one side and then the other, looking into their eyes and smiling as if she knows them, as if they have shared grand and special things. Some turn aside, uneasy in a way they cannot account for. Others feel suddenly empty when her eyes leave theirs. So distracting, so complete is she that she is gone before many realize that she had no escort. She was alone, a parade of one. Perched on my bike in the distance, I remember looking up and seeing the torrent of stars we call the Milky Way. I remember wondering if she could see them, too, or were they lost in the light of the lanterns? The dancing took place on the center tennis court, which had been covered with a portable parquet floor. She did what everyone else did at the ball. She danced. To the, guy, uh, to the music of Guy Greco and the serenaders, she danced the slow dances and the fast ones. She spread her arms wide and threw back her head closed her eyes, and gave her very impression of thoroughly enjoying herself. They did not speak to her, of course, but they did not. They could not help looking over their shoulders at their dates. She clapped at the end of each number. She's alone, they kept telling themselves, and surely she danced in no one's arms, yet somehow it seemed to matter less and less. As the night went on, and the clarinet and coyote call mingled beyond the lantern light, the magic of their own powder blue jackets and orchids seemed to fade, and it came to them in small sensations that they went, they were more alone than she was. Who was the first to crack? No one knows. Did someone brush up against her at the punch table, pluck a petal from her flower? One was missing. Whisper high. This much is certain. A boy named Raymond Studemacher danced with her. To the student body at large, Raymond Studemacher did not have enough substance to trigger the opening of a supermarket door. He belonged to no team or organization. He took part in no school activities. His grades were ordinary. His clothing was ordinary. His face was ordinary. He had no detectable personality. Thin as a minute, he appeared to lack the heft to carry his own name. And, in fact, when all eyes turned to him on the dance floor, those few who came up with a name for him frowned at his white jacket and whispered, Raymond something. And yet there he was, Raymond something, walking right up to her, it came out later that his date had suggested it, and speaking to her, and then they were dancing. <clears throat> a couple steered themselves to get a better look. At the end of the number, he joined her in clapping and returned to his date. He told her the silver earrings looked like little trucks. Tension rose. Boys got antsy. Girls picked at their corsages. The ice shattered. Several boys broke from their dates. They were heading her way when she walked up to Guy Greco and said something to him. Guy Greco turned to the serenaders, the baton flashed, and out came the sounds of that old teen dance standard, the bunny hop. Within seconds, a long line was snaking across the dance floor. Stargirl led the way, and suddenly it was December again, and she had the school in her spell. Almost every couple joined in. Well, Hillary Kimball and Wayne Parr did not. The line curled back and forth across the netless tennis courts. Stargirl began to improvise. She flung her arms to a make-believe crowd like a celebrity on parade. She waggled her fingers at the stars. She churned her fists like an egg beater. Every action echoed down the line behind her. The three hops of the bunny became three struts of a vaudeville vamp, then a penguin waddle, then a tippy-toed priss. Every new move brought new laughter from the line. 
When Guy Greco ended the music, howls of protest greeted him. He restruck the downbeat. To delighted squeals, Stargirl led them off the parquet dance floor onto the other courts, and then through the chain link fence and off the tennis courts altogether. Red carnations and wrist corsages flashed as the line headed onto the practice putting green of the golf course. The line doodled around the holes, in and out of side pools of lantern light. From the dance floor, it seemed to be more than it was 100 couples, 200 people, 400 dancing legs seemed to be a single festive flowery creature, a fabulous millipede. And then there was less and less to see as the heads vanished, and the rest curled through the fringe of the light and followed, like the tail of a powder blue dragon, into the darkness. One girl in chiffon had a tiff with her date, and ran off towards the first tee, calling, Wait for me! She looked like a huge mint green moth. Their voices came in clearly from the golf course. The laughing and yelping made a raucous counterpoint to the metronomic tick tock 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 of the bunny's never ending hop. Once, in the light of the quarter moon, they appeared in silhouette on a domed, distant green, like figures dancing in someone's dreams. And then, quite suddenly, they were gone, as if the dreamer had awakened. Nothing to see, nothing to hear. Someone called, hey, after them, but that was all. It was, according to those left behind, like waiting for a diver in water to return to the surface. Hillary Kimball, for one, did not share that feeling. I came here to dance, she declared. She pulled Wayne Parr along, on the, along to the bandstand and demanded regular music. Guy Greco tilted his head to listen, but the baton did not stop and neither did the band. In fact, as the minutes went on, the music seemed to become louder Maybe it was an illusion. Maybe the band felt a connection to the dancers. Maybe the farther the line spun into the night, the louder the band had to play. Maybe the music was a tether or a kite string. Hillary Kimball dragged Wayne Parr out to the middle of the parquet floor. They slow danced. They fast danced. They even tried an old-fashioned jitterbug. Nothing worked. Nothing went with the triple thumping drum beat but the bunny hop itself. Hillary's orchid shed petals as she beat her fist on Wayne Parr's chest. Do something, she yelled. She ripped sticks of chewing gum from her, his pocket. She chewed them furiously. She split the wad and pressed the gum into her ears. The band played on. Afterwards, there were many different guesses as to how long the bunny hoppers were actually gone. Everyone agreed it seemed to be hours. Students stood under the last line of lanterns, their fingers curling through the plastic-coated wire of a fence, peering into the vast blackness, straining for a glimpse, a scrap of sound. All they heard was the call of the coyote. A boy dashed wildly into the darkness. He sauntered back, his blue jacket over his shoulder, laughing. A girl with glitter in her hair shivered. Her bare uh, shoulders shook as if she were cold. She began to cry. Hillary Kimball stalked along the fence, clenching and unclenching her fist. She could not seem to stand still. When the call finally came, they're back. It was from a lone watcher at the far end. A hundred kids, only Hillary Kimball stayed behind, turned and raced down eight tennis courts, pastel skirts flapping like stampeding flamingos. The fence buckled outward as they slammed into it. They strained to see. Light barely trickled over crusted earth beyond the fence. This was the desert side. Where? Where? And then you could hear whoops and yahoos out there, somewhere clashing with the music. And then, there, a flash of yellow, Stargirl leaping from the shadows. The rest followed out of the darkness, a long, powder blue, many-headed birthing. Hop, hop, hop. They were still smack on the beat. If anything, they seemed more energized than before. They were fresh. Their eyes sparkled in the lantern light. Many of the girls wore browning, half-dead flowers in their head, hair. Stargirl led them along the outside of the fence. Those inside got a line of their own and hopped along. Guy Greco struck the downbeat three final times. Hop, hop, hop and while two lines collided at the gate in a frenzy of hugs and shrieks and kisses. Shortly after, as the serenaders gratefully, gratefully played, Stardust, Hillary Kimball, walked up to Stargirl and said, You ruined everything. And she slapped her. The crowd grew instantly still. The two girls stood facing each other for a long minute. Those nearby saw in Hillary's shoulders and eyes a flinching. She was waiting to be struck in reply, and in fact... When Stargirl finally moved, Hillary winced and shut her eyes. But it was her lips that touched her, not the palm of her hand. Stargirl kissed her gently on the cheek. She was gone by the time Hillary opened her eyes. Dory Dilson was waiting, 
Stargirl seemed to float down the promenade in her buttercup gown. She climbed into the sidecar. The flowered bicycle rolled off into the night. And that was the last we ever, any of us, ever saw of her. Chapter 32. That was 15 years ago. 15 Valentine days. I remember that sad summer after the Ocotillo ball, just as clearly as everything else. One day, feeling needy, empty, I walked over to her house. A for sale sign pierced the ground out front. I peered through a window. Nothing but bare walls and floors. I went to see Archie. Something in his smile said he had been expecting me. We sat on the back porch. Everything seemed as usual. Archie lighting his pipe. The golden desert in the evening sun. Senor Seguro losing his pants. Nothing had changed. Everything had changed. Where? I said. A corner of his mouth winked open and a silky rumple of smoke emerged, paused as if to be admired, then drifted off past his ear. Midwest? Minnesota? Will I ever see her again? He shrugged. Big country, small world, who knows? She didn't even finish out the school year. No, just vamoosed. Mm-hmm. It's only been weeks, but it seems like a dream. Was she really here? Who was she? Was she real? He looked at me for a long time, his smile wry, his eyes twinkling. Then he shook his head as if coming out of a trance. He deadpanned. Oh, you're waiting for an answer. What were the questions again? Stop being nutty, Archie. He looked off to the west. The sun was melting butter over the Maricopas. Real? Oh, yes. As real as we get. Don't ever doubt that. That's the good news. He pointed the pipe stem at me. And well-named, Stargirl. Though I think she had simpler things in mind, star people are rare. You'll be lucky to meet another. Star people, I said. You're, you're losing me here. He chuckled. That's okay. I lose myself. It's just my oddball way of accounting for someone I don't really understand any more than you do. So where do stars come in? He pointed the pipe stem. The perfect question. In the beginning, that's where they can't come in. They supplied the ingredients that became us, the primordial elements. We are star stuff, yes? He held up the skull of Barney, the paleocin rodent. Barney too, hmm. Huh? I nodded along for the ride. And I think every once in a while, someone comes along who's a little more primitive than the rest of us, a little more closer to our beginning beginnings, a little more in touch with the stuff we're made of. The words seemed to fit her, though I could not grasp their meaning. He saw the vacant look on my face and he laughed. He tossed Barney to me. He stared at me. She liked you, boy. The intensity of his voice and eyes made me blink. Yes, I said. She did it for you, you know. What? Gave up herself for a while there. She loved you that much. What an incredibly lucky kid you were. I could not look at him. I know. He shook his head with a wistful sadness. No, you don't. You can't know yet. Maybe someday. I knew he was tempted to say more, probably to tell me how stupid I was, how cowardly that I blew the best chance I ever had. But his smile returned and his eyes were tender again, and nothing harsher than cherry smoke came out of his mouth. I continued to attend Saturday meetings of the Loyal Order of the Stone Bone. We did not speak of her again until the following summer, several days before I was to leave for college. Archie had asked me to come over. He took me out back, but this time not to the porch. Instead, he led me to the tool shed. He slid back the bolt and opened the door, and it was not a tool shed after all. This was her office, he said, and gestured for me to enter. Here was all the stuff of her activity that I expected to see in her room at home. The office whose location she would not reveal. I saw wheels of ribbon and wrapping paper, stacks of colored construction paper, cardboard boxes of newspaper clippings, watercolors and cans of paint, a yellow stack of phone books. Tacked to one wall was a municipal map of Mika. Hundreds of pins of a different color, uh, I'm sorry, of a dozen different colors pierced the map. There was no indication what they stood for. A huge homemade calendar covered the opposite wall. It had a square for every date in the year. Penciled into the squares were names. Across the top of the calendar was one word, birthdays. There was one dot of color in the whole thing, a little red heart. It was next to my name. Archie handed me a fat family album sort of book. The homemade title said, The Early Life of Peter Sinkowitz. I flipped through it. I saw the picture she had taken that day. Peter squabbling with the little girls over his beloved banana roadster. 
I'm to wait five years, then give it to his parents, said Archie. He pointed to a filing cabinet in the corner. It had three drawers. I opened one. There were dozens of red hanging folders, each with a name tag sticking up. I saw a borlock. Me. I pulled it out and I opened it. There was the birthday notice that appeared in the Mika Times three years before, and a profile of me from the school paper, and pictures, candid snapshots of me in a parking lot, me leaving my house, me at the mall. Apparently, Peter Sinkowitz wasn't the only target for her camera, and a sheet of paper with two columns, likes and doesn't like. Heading the list of likes was porcupine neckties. Under that was strawberry banana smoothies. I replaced my folder. I saw other names. Kevin, Dory Dilson, Mr. McShane, Danny Pike, Anna Grisdale, even Hillary Kimball and Wayne Parr. I stepped back. I was stunned. This is unbelievable. Files on people like she was a spy. Archie nodded, smiling. A lovely treason, hmm? I could not speak. He led me out into the dazzling light. Chapter 33. Throughout my college years, I visited Archie whenever I came home, and then I got a job back east, and my visits were less frequent. As Archie grew older, the difference between himself and Senor Seguro seemed to become less and less. We sat on the back porch. He seemed fascinated by my work. I had become a set designer. Only recently has it occurred to me that I became one on the day Stargirl took me to the enchanted place. On my last visit with him, he met me at the front door. He dangled keys in front of my eyes. You drive. An old tar pail rattled in the bed of his ancient pickup as he pointed me west to the Maricopas. In his lap, he carried a brown paper bag. Along the way, I said, as I always did, So, have you figured her out yet? It was years since he had gone, yet still we needed no name for her. We knew who we were talking about. I'm working on it, he said. What's the latest? We were following a familiar script. On this day, he stated, she's better than bones. On my previous visit, he had said, when a star girl cries, she does not shed tears, but light. On the other days and the other years, he had called her the rabbit in the hat and the universal solvent and the recycler of our garbage. He said these things with a sly grin, knowing they would confound me as I mulled them until our next meeting. We were in the foothills by early afternoon. He directed me to stop on a stony shoulder of the road. We got out and walked. He brought up the paper bag with him. I brought the pail. He pulled from it a floppy blue hat, which he mashed onto his head. The sun that had looked like warm and buttery at a distance was blazing hot here. We didn't go far as walking was a chore for him. We stopped at an outcropping of the smooth, pale gray rock. He pulled a small pick from the pail and tapped the rock. This'll do, he said. I held the paper bag while he put pick to rock. The skin on his arms had become dry and flaky as if his body were preparing itself to rejoin the earth. It took him ten minutes to gouge out a hole that he judged to be right. He asked for the bag. I was shocked at what he took from it. Barney! The skull of the paleocene rodent. This is home, he said. He said he was sorry he did not have the energy to return Barney to his original stratum in South Dakota. He laid Barney in the hole then took from his pocket a scrap of paper. He crumpled the scrap, the scrap and stuffed it into the hole with the skull. Then he pulled a jug of water, a small bag of patching cement, a trowel, and a plastic tray from the tar pail. He mixed the cement and trowel over the hole. From a distance, you wouldn't know that the rock had been altered. Heading back to the pickup, I asked what was written on the paper. A word, he said. The way he said it told me I'd get no answer to the next question. We rode east down out of the mountains, and we were home before sundown. When I returned next time, someone else was living in Archie's house. The shed out back was gone. So was Senor Seguro. And a new elementary school now occupies uh, Stargirl's enchanted place. The final chapter, More Than Stars. Since graduating, our class has had a reunion every five years, but I haven't yet gone. I stay in touch with Kevin. He never left Mika has a family there now. Like me, he did not wind up in television, but he does make good use of his gift of gab. He's an insurance salesman. Kevin says that when the class gathers for reunions at the Mika Country Club, there is much talk of Stargirl and curiosity as to her whereabouts. He says the most common question these days is, were you on the bunny hop? At the last reunion, several classmates for a lark lined up, hands to waist, and hopped around the putting green for a few minutes, but 
It wasn't the same. No one is quite sure what happened to Wayne Parr, except that he and Hillary broke up shortly after graduation. The last anyone heard, he spoke of joining the Coast Guard. The high school has a new club called the Sunflowers. To join, you have to sign an agreement promising to do one nice thing per day for someone other than you myself. Today's Electron Marching Band is probably the only one in Arizona with a ukulele. On the basketball court, the Electrons have never come close to the success they enjoyed when I was a junior, but something from that season has resurfaced in recent years that baffles fans from other schools. At every game, when the opposing team scores its first basket, a small group of Electron fans jumps to its feet and cheers. Every time I visit Mika, I drive past her old house on Palo Verde. On the most recent visit, I saw a red-haired young man across the street fixing water skis to the roof of a yellow Volkswagen Beetle. It must have been Peter Sinkowitz. I wondered if he was as possessive of the Beetle as he had been of the Banana Roadster. I wondered if he was old enough to love his scrapbook. As for me, I throw myself into my work and keep an eye peeled for silver lunch trucks. And I remember, I sometimes walk in the rain without an umbrella. When I see change on the sidewalk, I leave it there. If no one's looking, I drop a quarter. I feel guilty when I buy a card from Hallmark. I listen for mockingbirds. I read the newspapers. I read them from all over. I skip the front pages and headlines and go to the pages in the back. I read the community sections and the fillers. I see little acts of kindness happening from Maine to California. I read of a man in Kansas City who stands at a busy intersection every morning and waves at the people driving to work. I read of a little girl in Oregon who sells lemonade in front of her house for five cents a cup and offers a free back scratch to every customer. When I read about things like this, I wonder, is she there? I wonder what she calls herself now. I wonder if she lost her freckles. I wonder if they'll ever get another chance. I wonder, but I don't despair. Though I have no family of my own, I do not feel alone. I know that I am being watched. The echo of her laughter is the second sunrise I awaken to each day. And at night, I feel it is more than stars looking down at me. Last month, one day before my birthday, I received a gift wrap package in the mail. It was a porcupine necktie.